Okay, I've just scanned a few uh, original contracts and documents just so that you've got something else to see apart from me. It may be of interest <laughs> to you, but it's a bit of a diversion. Uh, hi there, I'm A.D. Crowsdale. Um, I've been into the Northern Soul scenes from either 68 or 69, I can't quite remember, a long time ago, um, and I've been in it pretty continuously. Uh, as a fan for a long time, then as a record collector, then I came down to London to uni, and after that I became a record dealer. I found I could make a few bob buying and selling records. Then, what came next? Uh, yeah, then we opened a club in London in 1979, and uh, that's still running now, so that's been going 31 years, and that's been playing this sort of music, Northern Soul and Rare Soul, uh, once a month, roughly for 30 odd years. Then. In 1982, I started working for the record company because one of the guys who owned the record company knew me as a collector and said, do you think you can put an LP together from these labels, Kenton Modern Labels out of Los Angeles? And I said, yeah, yeah, hopefully. Uh, and I must admit, I did a lot of phone calls to people like Gilly and Randy and a lot, you know, it's quite a communal thing, the Northern scene, so I did pick quite a few brains as well, uh, which is to do the job thoroughly. And they did very well. Uh, and I'm still working for them now. Um, and as the job has developed, I've learned a bit more about getting the rights to these recordings. Uh, now, probably what you need to know, first of all, is what rights are. Um, the recordings are obviously made in America in the 60s and 70s, and they uh, belong. The sound, there's two parts to it. There's the song and there's the music, the sound. The recording. The recording belongs really to the guy who paid for the sessions, arranged the musicians, arranged to get the song sung by the singer. So the label owner is the guy who starts out owning the, the sound that we're talking about, that we want a license to put out in England or Europe. Um, having said that, it might be a production company. Sometimes a label will have a little byline in it produced by half on productions. So it, the label owner might only have licensed that particular recording for a year or two and then it's, re and then it's reverted back to half on productions. So you have to sort of have quite an in-depth knowledge about whether the label owned it, whether the producers own it. And uh, you have to get to the right person because they quite happily let you pay, pay them twice. Yeah. The label owner will take it and the producer will take it if you can get away with it. Um, so that is how the song, we've got to find these people who own it. Sometimes the labels are eaten up by other labels, the recordings are bought by somebody else and it moves around. Um, so that's tough, but again, you know, you, you use your knowledge, you use your phone calls, you use your contacts and you try and find out who owns that recording that you want to put out. Uh, the other part of it is the song, uh, that's the other legal part, and that is uh, generally owned by the publisher. Uh, so you have publishing firms, like you have record label owners, and publishing firms buy songs or license songs from writers uh, who have obviously written it, um, and they, you, you pay them automatically. Um, through a system of uh, BMI, uh, David's dad's company uh, that he worked for in America, right over here, it's MCPS. So there's two issues, you pay for the song, and you pay for the recording. And uh, I'm gonna tell you more about it. I'm gonna tell you the history of it in, with the Northern Soul scene and how it came about. <coughs> Okay, well obviously the first 60 Soul recordings were actually released here at the time. They weren't, nothing to do with demand. People, for English record labels, would want to, would hear a record over in America, an American copy, and say, yeah, we'd like to put it out over here. You know, it's got potential. It may have been a hit already, so it's obviously going to have a good chance, a uh, hit in America, it's got more of a chance of being a hit over here. But in general, in the 60s, soul was quite a minority music. So it, it was a bit of a labour of love for a lot of people. Um, 
some, you know, the Tamil Motowns of the Atlantic and the Stacks, they hit, but more obscure labels very rarely made it over here. Um, but enthusiasts would put them out. Uh, sometimes it would be one of the major record companies over here, um, EMI, Decca. EMI had the stateside label, they licensed a lot of uh, small labels like Audio Arts, um, Red a lot, Diner Voice. Uh, London had Monument, had High Records out of Memphis, uh, Sue. And basically, they again, they were chasing hits, trying to get sales over here. But there were also some dedicated music men who worked for these record companies, and they would, you know, they just want to promote soul music because that was the music they loved. And like us, they want to spread the word and they want to get this good music appreciated. Um, now there was. A label called, well, Bell Records uh, is a big <coughs> label, and it was run by EMI over here in the 60s, the late 60s. And the guy who was the head of the label was a guy called Trevor Churchill, and he did these Bell Cellar Full of Soul LPs, which were, you know, things like Gold Wax Label, Aurora, different things that Bell in America uh, produced. And they, you know, they, they didn't sell that many copies, but that was the sort of thing. He was a he was a music fan, a soul music fan at a big company, and he was able to get some good records released over here. Now he's a traditional music business person. Uh, his, his background is an accountant, and he's one of the old-fashioned accountants where everything's written down, every pence is accounted for, and it's all done 100 percent legally. Now he's one of the three owners of Ace Records, so I got taught by a guy, an old-school guy who's straight down the middle and wouldn't, you know, would be upset if an artist lost a penny. Now, if a penny was missing in the ledger, he'd be upset about it. So it's nice to be able to work for a firm like that, where they actually, you know, do care about the artist and doing things the right way. Um, but that's jumping ahead a little bit. Uh, we, we're talking about the, the copyright things. Now, you get... So once you've got hold of the publishing company and the, uh, the label owner or the, the person who owns the recording, uh, you do a deal with them. Uh, you say, right, I want, to re I want to release over in England, either say the 60s in current terms or nowadays. It's, it's pretty much the same conversation. You'll say, you know, we want to release five tracks. We think they'll sell. We've got a rough idea they'll sell about. 2,000 copies each. So we work out the royalties. We can, we probably can advance you about, say, $2,000 for those five tracks because we're pretty sure we'll probably earn $3,000. But that's okay because as soon as the advance is reached, any extra cents go over to the person. So basically, we give out $2,000 for five tracks. When the 2,000 worth of royalties is notched up, then every dollar goes to America. It's accounted for every six months, so we don't send it a dollar at a time. Um, you know, there's, a, there's some extra money for them anyway when the advance has been made up. Uh, the publishing is more automatic. Uh, MCPS over here actually claim the money from you per sale, so at, at, at different periods, they will look at how many copies have sold and say, right, Ace Records, you owe us uh, $50.39 for that track, send it us. And then they will distribute it to the publishers, the sub-publishers, and then the publishers in Europe. So that's, that's the overall look. Then you have royalties. Now, royalties are included within these two fields. So the simplest one is the uh, songwriting royalties and to the publishers. And out of that, say, $50, the songwriter will get perhaps 6%, 7% of the money. I think the sub-publisher sub will get 70%, 30%, the American company will get 70%, and the writer will get 6%. So there's some money coming his way. Now, it's not a lot of money when you're talking about small sales, um, but it all, it all adds up. And, uh, you know, you can get big sales on things. Some of our CDs gone nearly to 30,000. Uh, some of the TV advertised CDs you see of Northern Soul and things like that, they do 40, 50,000. 
And uh, you know, in all of these cases, it's not a huge amount of money, but it's a good amount of money, and sometimes it can be very, uh, appre well, it is very appreciated, and it can make a big difference to uh, the, the, the rights owners' lives, actually. Sorry, is there a, a time limit uh, over the royalty? Uh, um, the yeah, that's very interesting actually because that's just changed. Um, well, no, on royalties for the music and to the acts mm -hmm. and the singers, uh, there's no time limit as long as, you know, if you're selling the product, you keep paying it. Yeah. Now, with publishing, you used to be able be able to backdate it to 1992, but they've just changed it now, so you can only backdate it six years, which is a bit of a blow, because the law on publishing is actually very strong, and it means that you can, you can, you can even enforce on bootleggers to pay the publishing, <coughs> um, but now it only goes back six years, you know, you're not gonna get that much for it, because most of the bootlegging, ironically, was done uh, in the 90s, <laughs> well, in this, between the 70s and 90s, there's less bootlegging actually going on today than there has been in the past, and I think that's because of the knowledge of what royalties are, what copyrights are, and the general, there's, there's more, I think there's a, more of a, well, we've old, we're older, we've studied this music now for 30, 40 years, we've learned a lot more about it, and I think there's less excuse to go bootlegging if there ever was an excuse. There's, there's much less excuse to do it now because you know you can do it the right way and a lot of people have proved you can do it the right way. Um, and on all the different formats, uh, ironically the first, uh, well not ironically, but oddly, the first uh, way of making money in the music industry was through song sheets because this was before records and, and uh, people would sell song sheets uh, of you know, something from the shows or the music halls uh, that there's a lot more money in publishing than there was in the actual uh, records and the equivalent of that. So uh, that's why, in a way, publishing is so strongly, it's easier to enforce legally publishing, because it's been going for a, you know, a much longer time than recording. But for every record, tape, CD, download, those percentages go to either the publishing side or the performance the recording side and again with the recording the artist gets a percentage I think again we're talking about six percent with some of the old deals for the artists the musicians don't get anything out of it but certainly not from the 50s and 60s and 70s later on some musicians managed to perhaps get percentages written into their contracts um, and very rarely do an, does an arranger or a produ producer uh, funny enough, this they, they get um, at the recording sessions they get a set fee, and this, although you can't see it, and hopefully I can explain what it is. These are checks. There was a session by Betty Bibbs in Los Angeles uh, for Kent Records, and th these are just some. When we bought Kent Records, we get all this great paperwork, and you learn different things. These are the checks that were given to the backing girls singers. And although you can't read it, these are about forty or thirty dollars each. Mm. Once to Shirley Matthews, once to Edna Wright, otherwise known as Sandy Wins, once to Carolyn Willis, who became one of the goes. And off the top of my head, I forgot the others. But on this little one session by Betty Bibbs that sold no records, she had five of the greatest Los Angeles singers in the world, you know, on that session. But they got their money for that. Now, if they then come back later, if we get Betty Bibbs to number one in the European charts, they can't come back and say we won percentage we were on that record because it was accepted that that's a flat fee then. And it was the same for the producers, arrangers, and all the musicians as well. Um, so the original licensing would have been contemporaneous to the big labels like London and Stateside or the smaller labels Tamla and Motown not being particularly smaller. There's, there's another band here, there's Atlantic Stacks, Tamla Motowns. They were so labels that had a great identity. And over here, they were managed by the major record companies, but they gave them their own logo over in Europe as well as in America. Whereas there's other more specialist soul labels like Sue Records, um, Soul City Records, that were run by soul fanatics, and they 
did little licensing deals all over the place. Uh, if you look in your, some of your old billboards, you'll see a tiny little advert. Um, Soul City Records, Monmouth Street, is interested to hear from any independent soul label producers who would like their records putting out in Europe. Um, so, you know, they were really scouring to get some new soul sounds out in England. Um, Sue was early 60s, Soul City was later. Now we come to the Northern Soul scene. Um, <coughs> we don't know where it started. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say Northamptonshire. <laughs> he says Liverpool. He's a pretty Walsall. Um, <laughs> but we do know it was in the late 60s and it was a, starting to be a, a sort of bit of an organic movement. Uh, it was incredibly small actually. Um, Somebody was saying about when they went to university and uh, nobody knew what they were talking about. Oh, this is completely irrelevant to copywriting. But my first day in my hall of residence, I walked along the corridor and out of one room, I heard, girls are out to get you by the fascinations. And this is before it got re-released. And so I just had to knock on the door. I said, why, why are you playing that? You know, what the hell? How have you got that? You know, it was a big record, and uh, I said, oh well, uh, I'm from Rottenstall up in Lancashire, says, and uh, I go to the Twisted Wheel. And this is sort of music we like. He says, oh, no, he says I've listened to it in Northamptonshire, you know. Um, and we, we were lifelong friends from just hearing that record knocking on the door. I went to the wrong university, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this was rank like seventy as well, so. Uh, I think no, I just got lucky. I have, I have some lucky coincidences in my life. But the demand was building in the late 60s for mid 60s records. Um, Soul City, that I mentioned, tended to, to release a combination of contemporaneous releases and old ones that they knew English soul fans wanted. And they put out Gene Chandler, Nothing Can Stop Me, which had, I think had come out about 65, 66. They put it out in 69, and it should have charted, but because all the copies sold in the north, the people who did the charts thought there was, there's a rabbit office in, say, in Newcastle, and uh, they thought there was something dodgy about it, and it never officially charted, even though its sales warranted it. But at the same time, I mean, this is all before it was called Northern Soul, and, and it's odd, because it was this small soul, small soul scene, but I think in those days, the music crossed over better to the general mods and kids about town because records like the Fascinations became big hits in England. There's Frankie Valley, you're ready now. The Towns, hey girl, don't bother me. The Towns ended up singing on top of the pops. Uh, again, I was at university, we were all about 30 or 40 of us sitting in the, in, in the television room and the Towns came on to do hey girl, don't bother me. I'd be telling everybody out what a great record it was and how they should see it should all watch it. And I mean, it's, it's a very sort of down tempo record anyway. And the Tams looked about 60 or 70 each. They had these ridiculous coloured Tam shanters on. And <laughs> I, I just sort of cringed a little bit because the music was cool, but I'm afraid in that, inter in that actual time, the Tams didn't look too cool in the early 70s. But that showed that, um, you know, re-releasing things legally, uh, not, you know, could actually get you a, a big hit and, uh, and earn, earn everybody a lot of money. I think the fascination's probably toured over here. They certainly knew all about it. Frankie Valley, I saw at the California Ballroom Dunstable, and he was only over for your ready now at the time. Four seasons didn't mean much then. Um, so that was the that was the legal side of it. The illegal side of it um, was bootlegs. Uh, I think you probably all know what bootlegs is, but that's putting out a record without the permission of the label owner um, and probably without the permission of the publisher. Although you don't have to actually apply for permission to a publisher. You have to pay your publishing, but you don't have to write to the publisher individually and say, I want to put out this song. They just want to get the money. They, they don't care too much because you can just sit there and get the money. Um, so. The Northern Soul scene started up, and I'm pretty sure I bought the first ever bootleg, which uh, it doesn't look good on my CV, but I went to uh, Leicester Market, where there was a guy called Jeff King who had a record store there. And I've been going to all night, so not long, six months, and She Blow a Good Thing by the American Poets was a massive record, and we loved it, and 
the DJ had a copy, but you know, nobody in the crowd ever considered having a copy. I mean, it, it wasn't for sale. Nobody knew what it was. It was almost mythical. And Jeff King says to me, yeah, you want a copy of The Poets? I said, yeah, you know, but how much is that going to cost me? And he says, oh, it's all right, uh, 10 bob, which was a bit more than a single, but, you know, it was a good price. You know, I, I don't know what The Poets was going for, but it must have been a lot more than that. And he showed me the label, it was a red label, said Old Soul Records. Now, Old Soul is what Northern Soul was called in our area um, before Northern Soul. And not a very... It's probably an even less inventive title than Northern Soul, but that's what it was. So Old Soul Records, Poets. And I didn't know what it was, but there were 10 bob, and I knew I could get more than that from So I said, right, I'll have three copies. <laughs> I took him to the Market Arbor all night, where you may well have gone, John. Did you go Market Arbor all night at the Lantern? Richard. Sorry, Richard. <laughs> that back then? Uh, no. OK. No, did. You didn't buy one off me then. <laughs> uh, and I sold them for 15 bob then, and, and they said, I think somebody said that's a bootleg. I said, I don't know about it. You know, it could have been an American re release. Um, but this was just about the first bootleg. This Jeff King character then went on, he did another couple on the old soul label, then he had a Soul Sounds label, which Charlie remembers, and uh, he had about 20 releases on that. Great titles, which was reflective of the scene at the time. Um, and Bootlegging then, actually, you had more chance of getting locked up and put away for it than, than you have done since, I think. And, and, and even if you didn't play the import duty on the records, um, and you have to stick a stamp on or something and, and pay an extra two bob, which is going to put the record out of the reach of many of the customers. Um, so it became, you know, it was a dodgy thing. And I think Jeff King might have actually gone to prison for bootlegging those Soul Sounds things. He certainly had to get out of the business and was never seen again. I'd, I'd love to meet him. He's one of the people I want to have a chat to. Um, and to be fair, one of the reasons he'd do it was because the record companies didn't know about it. If they did know, if you told them, they probably wouldn't have cared. Um, there was no real history. I mean, everyone on the scene in those days was probably between 14 and 22 or something. So there wasn't a great deal of experience or morals or anything going on there, just wanted to get the records and uh, Jeff King provided that service, which has been the argument that's gone on ever since uh, with some people. Uh, but uh, that, they were the first bootlegs that I remember. Then there's a copy, uh, a company called Selected Disc in Nottingham, they did a lot. Uh, and then there's this infamous character, Simon Susain, who's a Northern Soul uh, guy from Leeds, and he bootlegged a hell of a lot. Um, so much so that it became a problem for the DJs that they had to cover up records, and I'm sure perhaps you know, most of you know about cover ups. But basically, you'd stick a piece of paper over the label and give it a fictitious title so that the bootleggers, generally Simon, wouldn't find out what it was, press it up, and send it back to England. It was particularly bad for the scene in Killing Records when he did that because as soon as it was bootlegged, <coughs> nobody really wanted it. It was bad for collectors. Um, I think somebody was saying about uh, Seven Day Lover? In the film. Yeah, in the film, Seven Day Lover, uh, you know, for, I think, in actual fact, the original wasn't worth hardly anything uh, once it had been re-released. I think you'd pay something like 160 quid or whatever. As soon as it's re-released, you'd be lucky to get a fiver for a record you just paid 160 quid for because it was the sound that mattered. It was before the collector's scene had really developed. You were collecting the music more than the labels and the artifacts then. Uh, the other thing I remember was the acetates people used to make, one-off discs that you could do. And say, Times of Wasting, Four <coughs> Brothers was massive, it was worth 60 quid, which was about top price at the torch. And uh, the guy in London who sold it cut two acetates, and I think he probably sold them for 50 quid each. Uh, the acetate cost him five or something. Um, but it was the DJs wanted to have the sound, and, and probably the DJ playing the acetate would not be looked down on for having it. They'd just say, bloody hell, how did you get that? You know, Lucky well dance. done, we'll dance to it, yeah. Uh, like, yeah, moral. <laughs> we didn't have the moral guidance, although Dave Godin, who wrote in Blues and Soul and coined the term and everything, was a great one for moral guidance. I think he, had, he was in two minds a little about it. Because I suppose the alternative to the, I mean, he certainly never encouraged bootlegs, and he was always on the side of the artist and uh, everybody else involved. But I think 
as it was the, you know, this northern, young northern scene that he was championing against the London established music business, I think he's just stayed slightly on the fence there. I may be wrong, but uh, I can't remember him in those days speaking out too much. No, he does in his, in his columns. In the does he in the early 70s? In the early 70s. As yeah, well. okay, good. I'm sorry, Dave. <laughs> against <laughs> drugs, against bootleggers, <laughs> again. Yeah, oh, great, good. Well, I'm glad I, glad I got that wrong. Um, so then, yeah, we had cover-ups, we had lots of things coming in from America. It was ruining the scene to an extent in that the DJs and the dealers were getting so frustrated that Simon was trying to monopolise everything. Um, he moved to Los Angeles and he actually got in with some label owners like um, Mer Woods, label owner Randy Woods, and Audio Arts label owner Madeline Baker. And he borrowed the tapes occasionally and did cut instrumental versions or just nicked them, according to Madeline Baker. She said he stole them off him. But other people take a different view that he met these, like, these label owners and they sold him the rights, gave him the rights, and then he moved those, these rights on to people over here a little bit later on. But that's another story. Um, so... Then you, in the mid 70s, you, you, you got the, you know, Wigan was big, and there were a lot more people interested in, interested directly in Northern Soul than in the early 70s. And you'd get Capital Pie Disco demand, as was mentioned. Grapevine came out, so you would get these specialist labels. There was an alternative to the bootlegs, but they couldn't move as quickly as the bootleggers, uh, and they continued to come out from all different sources. Um, then we come to an interesting period when Wigan closed. Um, I've said the scene actually went further underground and regrouped to an extent. There was new clubs starting up, Stafford and the 100 Club, Morecambe Pier um, being particularly. You had new mods coming into it uh, as well from the Quadrophenia influence, uh, new fans of, of 60s soul music. Uh, so it was a very interesting time. Um, and at Kent we did very well, we started off with that Kent modern label that I told you about from Los Angeles, then we got the rights to original sound, uh, then we applied to, it, to EMI for some of their recordings and uh, everything else like that. Um, then, so we're an established record company, it's hard because we're, we're paying all the royalties, paying our dues, by then there's another record company started up who aren't so keen on paying the dues, and so we're fighting with one hand tied behind the back to an extent. They can put out pretty much what they like. Because there was this myth came about, which I'm sure they uh, helped promote, that if you couldn't find the label owner, you could put out the record, put the money into a suspense account, and give it them later when they eventually turned up. Uh, that's never been the law. Uh, <laughs> And they were just, you know, that, that was a bit of a smoke screen to get away with basically bootlegging. Um, so, you know, it was a bit tough at that time because they, they you know, although we were getting a good choice of, of, of titles from these big companies, EMI and, and those, uh, we couldn't match them because they were going for virtually everything from the Northern Soul top thousand. Um, but being a legitimate record company, has its advantages. Uh, is Mr. Technician there? Could you play just a couple of little bit of music for a change? Um, you're going to tell me what do these songs have in common that is relevant to this song? Just thought we should have some music. There's something about just.
technically know what those three records have in common? Unreleased. Unreleased until our record company got in there. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm partly saying this because it was us, but it would have been great if other record companies had been doing the same thing. Because you're legal, the big benefit is that American record companies will give you the master tapes so you get better quality. And they, some of them are happy for you to go through their old, dusty old tapes and see what other music's there that were recorded at the time but didn't come out. And we did this originally really with Scepter One music in Nashville. And we found the Magic Touch, the first record you heard. Then we found some fabulous Maxine Browns, Chuck Jackson's version of No, No, uh, Not My Girl, Johnny Hampton by the Platters. And basically, we just found a lot of brand new 60s recordings, cut at the time, but no one had ever heard. And I think that really helped the scene throughout the 80s. Gave it a bit of boost. We gave them to DJs at Stafford as well to play. And it certainly you know, gave it a big um, boost. And although it's indirect with copyright, uh, it, it just shows you that you know that's a big advantage of not being a bootlegger, basically. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that, that good guys win sometimes. Um, we went on to buy record labels uh, as as we got bigger. Um, in, in, when you go to a, 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 an American music owner, right, Sony, you, you can offer to either license it off him, or if he's not in the music business anymore and he's not particularly bothered about it and doesn't want to be handling, I mean, he's meant to pass on all the royalties to the artists and things like that. So we actually sometimes buy records, buy labels outright. Um, and how it benefits the label owner, like Dave Hamilton's records from Detroit, there's a guy called Gilly who put us onto that, and we found that this producer, uh, he, he was one of the original Funk Brothers, we got thrown out of Funk Brothers for uh, trying to get union scale, and Barry Gordy didn't want that. <laughs> So uh, he was kicked out. He did his own thing. He just had this marvellous collection of tapes that probably only about, for some reason, only about 30 or 40 percent of them made it to vinyl at the time. So we were finding great music by people like O.C. Tolbert, Little Ann, um, and different acts. And that meant that we gave, he actually died, unfortunately, before we'd completed the deal. But his wife, Alice Hamilton, is well looked after now in her old age from these regular checks that came in. Little Anne, one of the singers, who'd only ever cut one single in her life, um, she got to, she got some sort of stardom and she came over to Cleethorpes and she sang for us there and she got, a, a, you know, songwriting royalties. And, that, you know, that's what you feel good about the job is that you can say, you know, I'm not bootlegging, I'm getting money to the right people yeah it's only going to be it's not going to be a fortune but it's going to be whatever it sells we all hope it sells more than you know as much as we can so we can give you as much as we can we'll have earned more um so basically uh that's the history of copywriting and it's uh luckily that the bootleg seems to have died down a fair bit now um but we're still plodding on We have time for one or two questions. If anyone has anything, please. Could I ask, um, in terms of the uh, sort of newly discovered music, you're talking about looking through dusty old tapes, the stuff that's come out in, in the last 20 years, is that stuff that's been sifted through after the best stuff has already been released, or is that something that's entirely newly discovered? Uh, that's the part I mean, that the, the original stuff came out of, and this is what's never been opened. Well, now it's all been opened and some has been discarded and then yeah. taken back after. Good point. It was recorded at the time uh, and different companies did it in different ways. Dave Hamilton may have cut tracks that he couldn't afford to press up at the time because he you know, wasn't doing that well, he didn't have that much money and perhaps another project came along. He wasn't the most efficient of blokes and so some of these little hand things just lay around doing nothing. Other big companies like the RCA ones, the, the Lorraine Chandler, she went in and cut a single. She cut four tracks in that session. It was only ever going to be a single. They decided which two they liked, which two they didn't. Uh, the famous story of Cameo Parkway was to do that. And the guy who owned Cameo Parkway would take home the four, he'd cut four acetates of the songs, give them to his daughter who was 10 years old, say which of the two best ones, and his 10 year old daughter would decide what came out on Cameo Parkway. Because, you know, it was a throwaway industry. He, was, he, was, he, he thought she was the sort of person who'd got ears for the kids and stuff like that. So, um, lots of different ways, but uh, 
they were, they were cut, but they're beautifully put on single, but either financial or just out of choice, they never made it onto single, and we, they were forgotten about, and we found them later. Here we go. Um, just move, uh, going off on what you're saying about bootlegging, what are your thoughts on current practices of people digitising their collections and then sharing them on file sharing sites? Uh, and also, uh, sort of second part to that, how does that fare for somebody like you who obviously runs a small label and with the advent of file sharing becoming quite a popular way of people consuming music, you know, how does that affect you as a small label? Um, it obviously makes life a lot harder because uh, they're getting the music for free and we're trying to sell it as a commodity. Um, it's one thing, you know, downloading a couple of tracks or, or, or doing, you know, e emailing one MP3 to your friends you, you might like it. It's another thing putting it on a site that is open to anyone in the world to take that music from. It's stealing the recording that was made from the artist and the producer. It's stealing the song from the songwriter. And uh, we're very much against it. We're also, funnily enough, I mean, just to show how really moral this lot are at Ace Records, there's this 50 year out of copyright thing now. And in England, you legally can put out anything recorded before 1960. Our company won't acknowledge that that's fair. They still think it's denying royalties to the artists and to the correct people. And we continue to license all music from whoever will license it to us and pay them a royalty even though we don't have to. So, because it's still going either to the artists or the artists' families, and uh, you know, we, we just think that you should pay for music because it, it was, you know, it's taken a lot of effort, skill, artistry to do. Uh, you know, it isn't a free commodity, it never has been really. One, one last, what's the most satisfying project you've worked on? <coughs> um, those RCA tapes took some, some beating. Um, they're all recorded in Detroit and New York by my favorite producers, musicians and arrangers. And I just saw the titles and I, was, I had to sit in an office block in Manhattan, which was in RCA's studios, uh, looking out over the whole of Manhattan, beautiful sunny day. And uh, I'm in the studios with uh, the engineer who's written the song, a guy called Tony Cotto. Um, and he's written, what's that on your finger? I knew it by Willie Kendricks. I've never heard the original by Kenny Carter, one of my favorite singers. And I'm sitting there in these huge bank of bloody speakers and he plays the tape and uh, you know, it was incredible. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let me jump right in. Before beginning, I want to thank a group of people for their assistance in promoting today's program. They certainly include all of our speakers, once again, um, but also Eric Knudsen, the head of the School of Media, Music, and Performance here at Salford, Ben Light, the associate head of 